We welcome to INFS 321 Information Sources. Session 11 looks at electronic resources. Students, I am sure you can recollect that when you talk of information sources, we are not only looking at print sources, we are also looking at electronic sources. So for the next two sessions, we'll be looking at electronic resources and looking at the usefulness of electronic resources in the information environment. So at the end of the session, we are going to have a brief history of how electronic resources started. We'll also look at how CD-ROMs came along and then how databases were started and now we use a lot of databases. You would also get to know about the databases that the University of Ghana subscribes to. And more importantly, how to search the databases. So this time we are going technology. It is all technology. So how did electronic resources start? It began with the development of computer-assisted typesetting and printing. Now, before the computer technology advancement in the late 1960s, librarians consulted standard printed reference works. That means they consulted the book reference works. The publishers of indexing and abstracting services first used computers to print paper products. It was subsequently that these same paper products were converted into magnetic tapes for librarians to search articles or citations to articles that were required by users. So we had the magnetic tapes, but these were not end user materials. So as a user, you needed any information from the index. You need to submit your request to the librarian during the day, day time. The request or the query is queued in, keyed in during day time. The magnetic tape runs against the query at night and the results are delivered the next day. Unfortunately, if you should make any typographical error, or any errors in the queries, there'll be no results for you. And so the process has to be commenced or start all over again. Now the rate at which results were coming out from this type of use of magnetic tapes and queries sent at night gave it the name batch processing because users' queries were processed in batch. These this kind of process formed the foundation of information retrieval in the early 1960s. Fast forward to 1970s, we had the computer and then the speed and memory all increasing, communication with computers and telephone also increased, magnetic tapes were replaced by faster disk, we had modems, uh, enabling us to access remote huge computers and finally we had databases becoming available for librarians to use. Now these databases were user friendly and users could search the databases and retrieve the information that they wanted. This was known as online searching. So the users just used the databases, found out a number of things that they needed, and then they either printed the information, downloaded and printed, or just read online. These are how the indexes and abstracting services changed from the batch services or the batch, or batch processing to the online section. And so, Librarians were no longer performing searches on behalf of users. With the online searching, users were able to search directly because they were friendly, they were online services, and users were able to find 
their own formation, just sitting behind the terminal and looking for the information. Now, alongside the databases came the CD-ROMs. The CD-ROMs were available in the mid-1980s. They are the shiny compact disc, and they stored a lot of information. And another advantage of the CD was its ability to search the index. And so it was very good in storing lots and lots of information. But it also had its challenges. Some of them tended to be expensive. You would wonder how just a CD-ROM is expensive because it's just the shiniest, round, shiny thing. But it is not only that shining substance that you need. It's the information on that substance which made it very expensive. Another disadvantage of the CD-ROM was the lack of standardization. And so student users could not carry one search strategy from one CD-ROM to the other, hoping that it will be the same. Publishers produced different ways in which you could access the CD-ROM. And so we come to databases. And this is the most current of our searches. Um, the database is a collection of information on one or more related topics. A database is a set of information formatted into defined structures. So we can have a database of students. We can have a database of universities. So a database of students will comprise information such as the student's name, the student's course that he's doing, the student's ID, the student's sex. That is related information. That is why we describe the database as a collection of information on one or more related topics. There are two main types of databases. We have the bibliographic database and we have the non-bibliographic database. Now, the bibliographic database are the machine-readable form of indexes, all the indexes and abstracts. We do not contain detailed information. So the base record in a bibliographic database is the citation. When we talk about bibliographic citation, we mean the author's name, the title, the publication, the, the page number, and what have you. A bibliographic database can also be an abstract. So it may contain the abstract or summary of the abstract, the subject heading, the author, the title, and the source information. But it will not contain the full text. So you would have the indexing information, you have the abstract information, but the full information is not contained in a bibliographic database. That is what can be obtained in a non-bibliographic database. So what's a non-bibliographic database? It's a variety of databases distinguished from bibliographic database by content, style, or format. So a non-bibliographic database contains information other than just citation to the books or to the articles, but it contains the detailed information. And we talk of two broad categories of non-bibliographic databases. We have the textual databases, examples being some of the University of Ghana online databases, such as Emerald, JSTOR, um, Black Wells, and the rest. These are textual databases. They will provide us with the text of materials itself. Then we also have the numeric databases. As the name implies, only numbers and figures. We also have other types of databases and what we call the bibliographical utility networks. These are networked databases. Examples of them are the OCLC, which you need to read more on. 
It stands for Online Computer Library Center. And then the RLIN, which stands for Research Libraries Information Network. These are networked databases. You need to have a subscription to be able to access the information that you need from them. So let's look at a few examples of the University of Ghana online databases. We have all this list. Agora, we subscribe to Agora, American Institute of Physics, and BioOne, and all of them there. Now, if you're on campus, you do not need any password to be able to access these databases. Once you go into the library website on campus and you click on any of these databases listed here, it launches you straight into that database and you are able to search full text. Others, other databases include all the lists here and a few databases which are free on the internet includes the list what you have here. African Journals Online, Biomed Central, Google Scholar, High Wire Press, Popline One. I mentioned that to be able to use these databases, you need to be able to search them. So we are going to look at search strategies, and this is very important for you to be able to use the databases. To obtain information from a database or even a CD-ROM, you must know a series of commands that will allow you to search. Now, one important search strategy is the use of the Boolean logic. I mentioned Boolean logic in a couple of lectures earlier. So now let's go into detail and look at Boolean logic and what it is. Boolean logic uses a set of logical operators known as AND, A-N-D, O-R, or N-O-T, not. And these allow you to combine words and phrases either to limit or expand your search. The OR operator really expands your search. It makes inclusive every item, that means any keyword that you list, it is included in your search. The AND operator limits your search, your search to just the keywords that you have listed. So let's look at examples of the OR operator. Do you see that the college and the university and even in between, it's all shaded? Yes, when you use the OR operator, you are referring to everything, college or university. So if the, the computer is able to find any information on college, it is a hit because that is what your operator said. If it finds anything on university, it is also a hit because you put in those two terminologies. Even if it finds materials under college and university, they, in, they are inclusive in your keywords. And so everything is brought up. So when you use the R operator on the computer, you are in effect collecting a lot of information. That is what the R operator does. Then we have an AND operator, which is very restrictive. If you can see from the diagram, I, I did a search for poverty and crime, and it is only the intersection which is highlighted. That is what the AND operator does. It just restricts it to the terms that you have used, and so it narrows the search for you. So for poverty and crime, it means that you are telling the computer, I want information which has both terms available. The term poverty and crime is only available in the intercession. When you move out of the intercession, it is only one of those terms. But because you use the operator and, the computer understands that you need to see both terms 
in the articles that they will retrieve for you. Then we have the not operator, which also excludes certain items. For instance, you have cats, not dogs. If you look at the shaded portion of cats, it is only information on cats. If you move out and come to the intersection, you have a few dogs there. But that is not what you're looking for. You are only looking for cats. If you go to the other circle, we have dogs there. But in your search, you said you want cats, not dogs. So that is how the Boolean logic operates. And it's best represented with the Venn diagram. We also have what you call the implied Boolean, which uses symbols. So instead of the A and D, you'd use the plus sign. Instead of the um, OR, there's no sign there. And instead of um, no sign, um, instead of um, not, you use the minus sign. When you come to the OR operation, you have no symbol there. Now, if you look at these examples, if you're in front of your computer, just type this one in plus school underscore of plus underscore public underscore public health plus Harvard underscore university plus Titanic minus movie. All right. So in the first example, what I am trying to tell the computer is that I want you to search school of public health as one term. I don't want you to give me separate searches for school separate searches for public and separate search for health. School of Public Health should come out as one word. And then Harvard University should also come out as one word. And so in effect, I'm telling the computer, I want the School of Public Health at the Harvard University. I just don't want health at Harvard University or public at Harvard University but it must be the School of Public Health at the Harvard University. So look at the underscore. They also mean it's a form of what? And you are closing the gap. When you have another example, plus Titanic minus movie, you are telling the computer, yes, you're looking for everything Titanic, but you don't want the movie Titanic. So if it's a ship Titanic, yes, but not a movie Titanic. That is what the implied Boolean using these symbols represent. There are other ways in which we can represent the Boolean logic. For instance, if you are using the Boolean logic or, we can represent it using the quotation marks. So you have Harvard University Library in quotation marks is the same way to express it as Harvard underscore university underscore library. So if you're talking of Harvard University Library, and you're not referring to just Harvard, or just the university, or just the library, you have to put it in quotation marks. If you don't use quotation marks, you can also use the underscore, which makes it one single word. Then we have another way in which we use the Boolean operators. This is what you call the predetermined language. And you would see a lot of these in the non-bibliographic databases. You remember I talked about the non-bibliographic databases, examples, the Emerald, the JSTOR, the Blackwells, the, the others, yes they use a lot of these predetermined language. So for instance, if you are searching and they give you these options, all of these words, it represents the Boolean logic and. Any of these words represents the Boolean logic or must not contain represents the Boolean logic not. Ladies and gentlemen, another search strategy is called truncation. Truncation refers to the shortening of a word or eliminating some characters 
from a longer term to pick up variants. It's a form of the Boolean operator or. It's also called the wild card search. Now, usually you have the stem of a word and you use the symbol to represent what the truncation is. And it can bring out the different variants of the word. Some symbols used in truncation include asterisks, question marks, the colon, or even the plus sign. And this actually depends on the particular search engine that you are using. I believe you all know what search engines are and the popular search engine being Google. So depending on the particular search engine you are using, you can select the truncation sign. And to be able to determine which truncation sign is used with which search engine, refer to the advanced search of the particular search engine. Go to the advanced search section and it will tell you which of the symbols it is using or it accepts for truncation. So let's look at some examples of truncation. <clears throat> we have left truncation, where the symbol is on the left and the stem is on the right. So for instance, if you have asterisk ship, the computer can bring out words such as librarianship, statesmanship, relationship, and the different kinds of words which end with ship. If you have the right truncation, then the symbol is on the right, but the stem is on the left. So for instance, you have the term L-I-B-R, and then you have your truncation symbol. The computer is going to generate words such as library, librarian, libraries, librarianship. Yes, because it's, the stem is L-I-B-R. Then we have also what you call the middle truncation, where we have another symbol representing it. And usually these are supposed to come out with different spellings of a particular word. For instance, you have L-A-B-O and then your truncation sign and R. It retrieves the American spelling of labor, the British spelling of labor, so American spelling of labor, L-A-B-O-R, British spelling, L-A-B-O-U-R. So it retrieves all the different s spellings, either British or American, of a particular word. That is middle truncation. For your assignment, you will need to look at these practice questions you will need to discuss the advantages and dis disadvantages of print resources as well as electronic resources. You need to enumerate at least five databases in CD-ROMs and also mention the challenges with CD-ROMs. There is also an assignment on the Boolean operators. So Kindly do these assignments and go to Sakai in the chat forum, discuss this assignment with your friends. I hope you have enjoyed this session on electronic resources. Thank you very much.